Hello and welcome to Tomorrow's Science Discovery 2.02. Today we're talking to Mary Michael Sherrier about synthetic living uh, materials and synthetic biology. But my name is Lisa and I've got Jared with me today. We're going to be hosting this interview and we want to get straight into it. So uh, Mary Michael is a scientific engineering associate at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And she's working on really cool stuff like synthetic biology and how we can make engineered living materials. So Mary Michael, I just wanted to start off by asking you, why are engineering living materials such a cool thing to work on and what are the natural materials that they're trying to replicate? Yeah, so they're a really interesting thing to work on, um, largely because we have a great ability to make hard materials and static materials, but we're not very good at making things that are self-healing or self-assembling. You know, everything we make, like concrete and steel, requires a lot of input on our half, and it, it is what it is at the end. Um, but living materials have the ability to grow and self-heal. They have the ability um, to make multiple materials within a single uh, vat. And so you can think about things like bone, or nacre, which is that beautiful inner um, iridescent layer of a mollusk shell. And these things are amazing because they have the ability to be extremely strong. They have the ability to have fracture resistance. So they don't, you know, when you crack them, they slide or try to prevent the crack from propagating. But at the same time, they also can have some flexibility. They can have the ability to grow or heal a crack that does form. And also just self-assembling. You know, there's no human being going in and putting the parts in one by one. They just grow on their own. So we want to mimic that ability. And basically where it comes from is the idea of hierarchical assembly. So a mollusk shell basically has all these different levels of organizations. So down on the, you know, nanometer level, it's got these tiny little particles and um, biomaterial, which is just kind of like sticky material, and it puts those together in a way. And then those, that layer kind of grows into larger platelets, and those platelets grow into the larger shell. And so by having all of these different layers of organization, it ends up having emergent properties that say the sand or the biomaterial on their own absolutely don't have. The biomaterial is just squishy, the sand is just particles, but together they make this incredible iridescent, beautiful, and strong shell. And so we want to try to mimic that. So kind of like um, living composite materials, like carbon fiber, but yeah. with living cells and, and materials that surround them. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, so what are the current um, state of uh, engineered living materials that we have at the moment? Are we even close to making artificial bone or anything like that? Yeah, in some ways we are. It depends on kind of the different field, but you know, we're still in the stage where we're learning to control it and we're learning to build it on different levels. So we are getting to a point where we're kind of good at the micron nanometer scale ordering and we're kind of good at the big you know, millimeter, centimeter ordering, but getting all the different levels to come together, uh, getting them to create themselves without us having to say 3D print the different organizational levels, that is still a little ways away. Um, there's also just the aspect of, you know, anything that we are going to try to apply in the world is going to need a lot of um, verification and control and understanding before we just release it out there. You know, if you're talking about something that's going to be used in civil engineering, you need to know that that's not going to break down and your wall or whatever your, your filtration system is going to hurt people because it, it wasn't tested enough. Um, so that is one of the big things about synthetic biology that slows things down. We can make stuff in the lab, but we really still have a long way to go to prove um, their real world application in some of these things. But as far as actually building the materials, you know, there's a lot of work being done to use cells to mineralize things around them. So there's natural systems in a lot of bacteria, like cyanobacteria, where really when they're just in nature, they take up calcium carbonate and form little rock-like structures, little crystals around themselves naturally. Um, and so there are other bacteria that can't do that. And so sometimes we transfer the ability from one to the other. Um, and 
we also are looking at, okay, what other materials could we attach to the cell surface to get that kind of ordering? And that's where my work starts to come in, where I start to use S-layer proteins, which are these really cool proteins that are on the surface of a, a cell. And they're found on almost all bacteria. And it's basically like chain mail. It's this really highly ordered protein structure. Hey, there it is. And, um, and this is the one from Colobacter crescentis, which is a little freshwater bug that you can find all over the place. And basically, this little chain mail forms on the surface of the cell um, for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's protection. Sometimes it helps it move. A lot of times it's a molecular sieve, so it helps, you know, trap or prevent things from going in or out of the cell. And so it's basically just this uh, natural protective layer. But what we have discovered is that by inserting different things at various points within this layer, you can then create attachment points all over the cell. And so, the, you know, by using the S layer, we have so many attachment points, like thousands upon thousands. And then you can start attaching different things to the surface of the cell, whether it be a hard material like a nanoparticle or calcium carbonate or something that will grow a more hard, stiff material or something like a biopolymer, which is similar to what, you know, you see in a lot of shells and it's, it's sticky. It can form hydrogels or protective gooey layers. Um, and so, you know, you just, pick and choose what you want to bind to the cell. And then the cell just basically uptakes it out of the solution and starts growing into a larger and larger um, material. And depending on what you're trying to achieve, you would bind different materials. Um, based on where my lab is right now, we are testing different materials and then using different kinds of techniques like atomic force microscopy, which honestly is basically taking an extremely fine stick and poking it. Like we have not moved beyond caveman times where we're literally just poking <laughs> things with a stick. <laughs> but basically we build this, this material of say nanoparticles and cells that grows on its own, it heals itself. And then we poke it with a stick and we see how, um, how strong it is, how flexible it is. Does it just break apart when we poke it? Or does it hold together? Does it depress and then expand kind of like memory foam in your bed? You know, and then we start to see what kind of properties arise from different attachment points, different materials, um, different cell lines. And then we start to see, okay, can we order it? And that's where we're at right now is trying to explore what happens when we attach things to the cell. So it sounds like your group has uh, had multiple different uh, experiments going on with this, this one organism that you're using. Uh, so I think the best way to kind of tackle each of these is, I'd love to go into each of these individual components that you mentioned. So actually modifying the S layer protein and then what you added to it. So you guys talked about how, uh, you just mentioned you guys added um, different uh, um, uh, proteins to it and then also um, nanomaterials as well. So let's talk about those two things separately. But first of all, can you tell us a little bit about how you actually, how does one actually modify a protein that exists in, in, a, in a bacteria? Like, do you go in there yeah. and, and shove the protein in there? Yeah, or poke it really hard again? With a or, stick? Yeah. yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, all the work that's really done with microbial synthetic biology is starts on the DNA level. And so instead of, you know, the final point where you have a protein that is going to have a function, we actually go back to the code that writes that protein, similar to if you wanted to modify a program on your computer, you know, you can mod try to modify the program, but really what you want to do is go back to the original source code, change that, and then the program becomes different over time. And so what we do is we basically first identify the gene that makes the protein. So in this case, for Colobacter, it's this gene called RSAA, which doesn't really stand for anything. Microbiologists and molecular biologists just like to make up really complex letter acronyms for things. <laughs> And so that gene basically in the cell will create a protein that then moves to the cell surface, attaches and crystallizes and makes that hexagonal um, picture that you saw before all over the cell surface. So what we do is we go in, look at that gene and see, okay, where could I stick things inside that gene that will still allow it to make the protein and the protein will still create the structure that 
it naturally creates, but now with a little loop sticking out of it that has a binding um, event on it. So in the case of this image, what we were trying to do was attach a fluorescent protein. So fluorescent proteins are really, really great in molecular biology because they're just a tool to tell us, did this work? Basically, did this thing attach? And if it did, it's gonna glow. Very simple, you know, very easy to tell what it is. And so in this case, these cells are displaying something called spy tag, and the fluorescent protein has something called spy catcher on it. This is basically an, uh, a type of protein that when spy tag and spy catcher see each other um, in the solution, they're gonna bind together. And so if spy tag actually is in RSAA on the cell surface and being displayed, then the spy catcher fluorescent protein floating around is gonna come in and attach to the cell surface, basically telling us that yes, the genetic modification that we made actually resulted in a functional protein on the cell surface. So what you see here is in that top layer, we just stain the cells with a dye to show that cells are there. First step, just so when I look at it by microscopy, I know whether I'm actually just looking at cells or am I just looking at blank space. And then the second layer shows, did the protein bind to my modified S layer? And so you see in the first three um, columns, it's either missing spy tag or it's missing spy catcher. So one half of the binding event, whether it's on the cell or on the fluorescent protein is missing. So therefore you don't see any fluorescence because nothing came together. And then in the last um, you know, column four, row two, you had both spy catcher and spy tag. So the S layer has the binding peptides on the surface. The fluorescent protein has the attachment protein. And so they came together and you see that the purple fluorescence appeared. And then the bottom um, row is just the merging of those two, both the just dyeing the cells inside the cell and then the fluorescent protein attaching to the cell surface. And what's cool is that you can actually tell that the dye is inside the cell and the fluorescent protein is attached to the outside of the cell because you see that the purple is kind of an outline of the cell and the blue is on the interior. And we do this by basically, when we look at the microscope, we kind of go down and find a point where it splits the, um, the cell in half. And so you can see the inside and the, the outside of the cell at the same time. And this basically tells us that yes, the binding event happened, it did fluoresce, but it's also extracellular which is really important for biomaterials. Sometimes when you make these proteins, they get stuck inside the cell, and that doesn't really help us. Um, in the case of S layers, it's on the surface of the cell, which allows us to you know, modify and change the environment around the cell. And so that was what was really important about that image. And I just have to say that one of my super RAs, Lisa Yoon, uh, was the one who took that image. She got really, really good at doing confocal microscopy, which both saved me a lot of time and made beautiful, beautiful images like that. So I have a question from our chat room from Hannes Vorwerp and Twitch, which is actually extremely similar to a question I was going to ask, uh, which is, are you, all, are you finding this using nature's structural tricks, or are you just trying to mechanically create biological structures that can be used in engineering? Yeah, so um, it's actually kind of a combination of the two. Um, what we first do is look for natural biological uh, abilities of the cell, because if the cell can do something similar to what we are aiming for, it's probably gonna do it better than anything I can design, so why not just exploit that? But then, you know, and, and that's the case of an S layer. It's a highly ordered, extremely stable structure on the surface of the cell that I can then use. Um, but from there, it gets more into rational engineering. And so, you know, the idea of those two proteins that do the binding events, spy tag and spy catcher, that actually was originally a natural protein that then somebody engineered to be able to split and come back together. Um, and then when we're talking about what we're attaching to the cell, that is highly engineered as well. One of the big things is nanoparticles. Um, and those are something that are engineered in our lab. They are things like cadmium sulfide, um, little center cores that are then wrapped in materials that help it attach. And so that is a very engineered thing. And then also, you know, right now 
we are still just looking at what happens when we end, when we put all these parts together. But eventually, we would hope to have enough design rules come out of that that we could predict and plan what kind of materials trying to make. You know, if I attach, you know, this kind of nano nanoparticle to an S layer that has this particular structure okay, I know what kind of mechanical properties are gonna arise from that material. And that's still a little ways off, that's what we're exploring now. But that does get into the point where we hope to eventually be able to rationally engineer all the parts and then build a material that we understand fully. Um, I wanna go back to the spy catcher and spy tag system that you mentioned. I mean, it kinda of seems like it's the basis of, of this whole um, research. To me, it kinda of feels like, it, it, if I had to think of a real world analogy, it's kind of like Velcro, like the cells are, are, are expressing um, the protein, which is kind of like the hooks of the Velcro. And then the, you know, the materials that you want to add to the cell have like the fluffy part of the Velcro. And so, you know, they come in and they, and they stick to, to the surface of the bacteria. Um, so I want to talk about what we can attach to the fluffy part of the Velcro. Like we, we mentioned talking about, you mentioned uh, cadmium sulfide, which I think, is that a, um, is that a semiconductor? Uh, what kind of um, properties will we get out of, you know, attaching something like that to the cell? So um, the cadmium sulfide nanoparticles, we, we use that more just because it's a very good, bright quantum dot, basically. It, you know, when we shine a certain laser light on it, it's going to glow very, very brightly. And so it tells us that, yes, it's a hard material, it attached, it's, um, so it's more for, diagnosis of what kind of hard materials you can make. And we do different linker lengths, we do different sizes of nanoparticles to see. But, you know, as far as mechanical properties, something that small um, isn't going to impart too many nano, um, kind of nano level mechanical properties, <clears throat> though we do see some which is interesting. Um, and that's kind of a, a work that we're exploring right now. But uh, so the spy tags by catcher is definitely like Velcro because you have a little tiny small part and a really big protein, they come together. But the only difference is that it's irreversible. So it forms um, a bond basically that pretty much cannot be broken. It takes a heck of a lot of energy to break, which is really important in um, engineered living materials because you know most proteins have what's called an on off rate. And um, so things are going to come on, they're going to come off, and it's, you know, it's unstable because of that. But this is very, very stable, which is what you want in a material, because you don't want your material changing, hopefully, without your control. Yeah, totally. <laughs> There's a really good question um, in the chat room here, actually, in terms of figuring out uh, what we can attach to these, to the spy catcher or spy tag system. Um, Hanis Vorwerp is asking, can this be done manually, or can AI be utilized to help you in your work, I guess, in terms of finding out what might be useful to attach or um, um, different new and emerging properties of that system? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think right now we're still defining the rules. And so understanding how the binding event occurs, how different S layers, which have different geometries, affect that a binding event or different locations within the S layer, different materials, how they come on and off. For example, a protein attaches to the cell extremely fast, but a biopolymer, like a hydrogel-like material, binds um, a little bit slower. And so I think you know, right now we're still so new that we wouldn't really know what to tell the machine learning to do uh, and what to look for. But um, once we define a little bit more about the rules that apply to these engineered living materials and we have a little bit more understanding, then yes, it will be um, very important to start using those kind of tools to expand all the options so that we don't have to manually test every single variant. We can kind of look at the, the scope that the machine learning or the AI tells us what could work and what doesn't, and then go try to do real world applications. Um, people are doing that in synthetic biology now with some systems that are better understood. Um, but honestly, the, the, the big sticking point that sometimes happens, and this is somewhat related to the recent Nobel Prize, is that a lot of times what we predict doesn't actually work in nature. Nature goes off and does its own thing and it does not care 
what you think. Um, Frances Arnold recently said in a talk that she, she tries not to put too much thought into these experiments occasionally because nature does not care about your algorithms. Nature does not care about your predictions. It's gonna do whatever it wants. So a lot of times we do these predictive models for biology and then when we actually go in the living organism and try to apply it, it kind of goes off the rails and does its own thing, which is why um, techniques like evolution, where you're basically taking the cells and putting them in different conditions and forcing them to evolve and then analyzing that evolution um, becomes really powerful. But again, that's where AI can come in. If you do those kind of experiments, if you force changes to the genome or to the DNA, um, you get a lot of variants. You get a lot of information, a lot of data. So then having having a human go in and analyze all those changes is very difficult. So a lot of times um, that's where things like machine learning come in, where they go in and they do an experiment, throw the data into the computer, and then try to see if patterns emerge that can inform us on how to do rational engineering. So we've got two questions from our YouTube channel uh, that complement each other really well. So I'll do, I'll do one and then the second one and kind of we can hear from you on it. Uh, so Mike Taran is outright asking, what's the chance that this biomaterial mutates in a way that we can't control? Um, so kind of talking about the surprise of nature um, that it was throwing at you. Um, and then Elon Lift also in our YouTube channel is asking, how have rules and laws of gene modification affected your lab work? And also who makes those rules and what's specifically restricted? Yeah, so for the first one, um, what typically causes a cell to mutate or change is stress. Um, so what we try to do is create materials, create proteins that don't stress the cell out. And so that becomes um, a delicate balance of, you know, if you try to express your protein too much, it's going to take up too much metabolic load of the cell. Like it'd be like, if I told you to just, you know, grow hair all the time, don't do anything else in your body, just grow hair. And your body is going to kind of go, okay, no, I need to live. Um, and so that's the point where the cell kind of starts going, no, I don't want to do what you want. I'm going to try to change. I'm going to try to mutate to prevent what you are asking me to do. So in our materials, we really try to limit the amount of stress involved. And so that is one of the perks of using S-layer proteins. Because they're on the surface of the cell and because the cell already makes them in high, high abundance, there are tons of them on the cell, um, us attaching things extracellular to, to that doesn't really cause that much change or stress to the cell. The cell doesn't really see a, a notable difference. And in the paper, you, there are um, experiments we did to show that the protein is still being produced the same way it was produced naturally. And so that is one way to prevent mutation is to just keep the cell as chill as possible and in as natural a state as possible. But that isn't always possible. Sometimes you are creating things that do stress the cell out or that the stress, you know, the cell doesn't want to do and will try to mutate or for some other reason causes mutation. And in that case, uh, we start getting into a very big field of synthetic biology that's funded um, all over the place, which is basically the control of these cells in the environment. Um, if they start to mutate, if they start to get out of control, how do we stop that? How do we control it? And it gets into a whole big field of, um, you know, non-natural amino acids and oxytrophs. And these are things where basically we make the cells dependent on us to live. And so if they try to mutate and change and go out and do their own thing, we just take away what they need to live and they die. And so there's a lot of different um, methodologies being developed to prevent mutation and to have as much control as possible because we, we don't want a gray goo kind of situation. Yeah, there's definitely, yeah. there's a lot of regulations in place to, to prevent, um, I mean, that, the public expresses a lot of concern of this, right? You know, we don't want to be changing things in nature and then accidentally letting them out and, and destroying the world. Like, it, it's... There's a lot of processes you have to go to, like in terms of approval of getting these kind of biohazards in your lab, you know, safe to work with and safe for the environment. So it's cool to know that, that you guys are, are using those strategies. But we have a fantastic question in the chat room about keeping uh, the cells that you're working with alive. Um, and uh, Hanis Vorwep on Twitch actually wants to know um, the composite structures that you're making. Um, will they be alive or are you just using the cells to build the structure first with the certain traits and then the cells will die kind of as if 
like 3D nano printers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, all the different labs that work on engineered living materials approach this differently. There are a lot of them, um, especially out of MIT. They actually use bioprinters with cells and they print down the cells and sometimes they, they make what they want and then the material dies. Or sometimes on purpose the material is assembled by the cells and then we kill the cells because we don't want them involved anymore after they create the material. But for me, I'm actually working on truly living materials. I want the cells to survive hopefully forever and just keep um, being involved in the, the building of the material. Because that way, you know, if I build, say, a nice flat structure and somebody comes in and punches a hole in it, well, in my material, because the cells are living, if I provide them with a little bit of food or a little bit of the material that they attach, say, you know, um, calcium or a biopolymer, which sometimes they can make on their own, the cells will then grow into that hole and heal it. And so that is, in my mind, truly engineered living materials. They have to have a component of self-healing, self-repair. And I want that self-repair to be as hands-off as possible. So in the paper, we actually did an experiment where we took the cells, we bound nanoparticles to them, um, or they bound nanoparticles to themselves. And then we left them in solution with almost uh, no new food, um, so they ran out of food eventually and very little air. And we just left them on the bench top at room temperature for two weeks. Actually, we've done it for a month, but it was published for two weeks. And, um, and we basically saw after that time, what happened? Were they still alive? Did the nanoparticles hurt them? And what we found was that, yes, they were absolutely still alive. The nanoparticles were still um, encrusting the surface. And uh, what was even cooler was if we took a little bit of those cells that had been just sitting there for two weeks and we moved them into fresh media, fresh um, so fresh food, um, fresh nanoparticles, they actually then grew a new material. And so we have the ability to basically seed and grow a new organism and a new material from that point on, which is kind of the living point. And so I kind of think of it how for years we have tried to push nature out of our buildings, right? We have created these sterile environments and we, you know, our walls, our desks, all of our stuff, we don't want microbes. We try to get rid of them. And so now the industry is trying to think, okay, well, how can we reintroduce nature back into our buildings in a helpful and healthy way. And one of the ways to do that is to have microbes that are alive and can, you know, heal things in your environment or detoxify things in your environment. How cool would it be if, you know, your paint had the ability to freshen your air? Nice. Um, so uh, James Johnson in YouTube, and actually I'm going to bounce through a couple of these, uh, says that that sounds like it would be good for vascular needs. Um, Roger C on YouTube is also sort of asking space materials, like could we end up using it to build things in space? Um, and then Heliopausing is asking the big question um, that I definitely uh, want to ask, which is can you grow a burger in a Petri dish? Um, so th it sounds like there's just like a huge huge range of applications for this to be applied to. Yeah, for sure. So my research lately has been more, well, I've kind of had two. One has been in trying to do bioremediation. So using the S layer to then take things out of wastewater that we want or that we don't want. So for example, you know, gadolinium is very, um, very useful to us and it can be found in water, but it's very hard to get out because it's very, um, rare in the water. It's not very much of it. So microbes are great for that. Um, but I'm also working on structural materials. So, you know, I want to build actual things with mechanical properties. But then uh, vasculature, that is definitely a field of research people go into. I pretty much stay away from the medical field because I don't want to have to deal with the FDA and all of that nightmare. Um, but there are people who are actively trying to build um, vasculature and, and medical devices that use live cells to either create them or help them grow in, and be part of a human being. Um, obviously, that's a, that actually is a very exciting and very promising field of research. But again, whenever you have to do something with people, it's going to be a little slow. And then space research. I love 
space research. I have a little bit of a background getting to play around with um, space companies. And, and basically, synthetic biology has huge applications um, for both um, things like the ISS and, and, and long-term spacecraft, but also actually on other planets like Mars. You can talk about all sorts of applications from, you know, actually building materials, and hopefully those materials will impart extra um, abilities beyond a mechanical um, man-made material. So like I said, you could have something that was on the ISS that was part of the walls that helped keep the air clean. Or you could have a bacterial filtration system in the water that detoxifies everything and, you know, uses all of the waste to then produce something that's useful. You know, uh, microbes love to grow on our waste. And then if you engineer them correctly, they could then go and make a pharmaceutical for you or make some other chemical that that you need that would be very hard for us to take with us. Um, as long as we can just take the cell line, we can then create something from that. Um, so it's a little easier to transport. Um, and then there's also the idea on planetary surfaces of actually using them to, to engineer the environment we're in. Obviously, terraforming is way big. We're not talking about that. But in our small environment, you know, can they detoxify the Mars soil in a way that we can then use it? Because there's lots of chemicals in there that we do not want to have in there. Or um, a lot of microbes have the ability to take certain minerals out of soil that we do need. It's geomicrobiology. Um, you'd be surprised to see how much microbes actually affect and, and control um, the, the rock, the soil, everything around us. And so, you know, a lot of people can look at ancient rock structures and actually see how the microbes were affecting the, um, the structure that they're looking at. And so how can we do that on another planet that allows us to create a small biosphere that is useful to us? Because really when it comes down to it, down to it, humans can't live without bacteria. We can't live without these things. And these things, um, these little bugs are gonna change depending on the environment that we're in. So we need to understand and hopefully control that both for our health and also for producing things that we need. Yeah, there, there are some fantastic applications that you mentioned there, and there's actually a really great question in our chat room that relates to all of that. Um, FIT Orion on Twitch wants to ask what type of environments could such a system um, survive in, uh, vacuum or high radiation? So with uh, colobacteria, the, the species that you've been looking at, um, could you tell us a little bit about what environment it needs right now with your research to grow and whether you think it might be able to survive the, these extremer environments of radiation or vacuum? Yeah, so the great thing about microbes is that we find them everywhere, all sorts of extreme environments. So um, being able to uh, just find the microbe that can survive the environment you need. Currently, synthetic biology focuses very much on what we call model organisms, ones that we highly understand, know how to engineer, and are really great at doing what we want them to do, such as E. coli or yeast. But a lot of the field is starting to go into harnessing these other bacteria that live in these more extreme environments and can do these really extreme chemistries that we need rather than trying to put them in E. coli. Um, a friend of mine actually has a company called Microbiar that basically looks at these extreme microbes and then tries to domesticate them, to take them in her lab and figure out how to modify their DNA, how to grow them, how to control them, because that is uh, a huge field for research in Itself, just understanding how to deal with a new microbe. Um, as far as cyanobacteria, um, or not cyanobacteria, colobacter, um, so they are a freshwater bug. They live in your ponds and streams, probably in your tap water. They're kind of everywhere, um, but they like to live in semi- warm to cool environments. They don't need very much food. And that's one of the reasons why they are so great for biomaterials. We don't have to feed them very much. They're very happy in um, just pure water in a random room temperature environment. They're very friendly to human beings. Um, they are not toxic to you at all. If you were to accidentally ingest some colobacter, it's probably not gonna hurt you at all. Um, so that's why it's really good for thinking about things like um, a common wastewater stream on a spacecraft is cyanobacteria, um, colobacter would be really great in that. Um, 
if biomaterials because they don't need much food. It's great because you don't have to constantly be replenishing a the food. They have the ability to just survive for a long time on minimal, minimal uh, resources. But, you know, if you are starting to think about more extreme environments or more specific applications, then you got to go to other bacteria. Like I was mentioning, cyanobacteria is great because it grows on sunlight, so you don't have to feed it as much. And it has all these cool abilities to do calcium mineralization and other detoxification things. So they're actually being looked at a lot for life support systems. Um, but then there are bugs that we have found you know, deep, deep in the ice and can survive really, really super cold environments. Or you look at different bugs, like the all time favorite is tardigrades. You know, we have exposed them to vacuum. We have um, exposed them to high radiation and they just kind of survive. They are kind of unkillable. It's a little disturbing and it's because they have this whole glassification state and that's a whole other field of research. But um, the key to you applying synthetic biology to extreme environments is finding the bug that already is pretty happy there. You know, um, one of the bugs I worked at Geobacillus sterothermophilus is a thermophile. It actually grows in really, really hot temperatures. And so if you have a wastewater stream or an environment that you're talking like 60 degrees Celsius, very, very toasty, it's happy as a clam in there. In fact, that's its favorite home to be in. And so you would use that bacteria for that environment rather than trying to force, say, E. coli to survive an environment that they're not really good at. Um, as far as vacuum and space radiation go, obviously, um, we don't have access to the microbes that are in that environment. But I truly believe that we will find in extreme environments life um, maybe it's on an asteroid. Maybe we discover that on the surface of the ISS, some microbes got out there and they've adapted and evolved and now they survive there and now we can use them. Um, so I, I do think as we explore the universe further, we will find life that we can harness for our own needs and hopefully um, make them a part of our world. In our chat room, uh, we have a question from Neuroborg, which I think is a very appropriate name for the conversation um, that we're having so far today. Uh, they're asking, that: do you think bioprinted organs for transplant will be created in maybe the next 10 to 20 years? So, um, like I said, medical field isn't really my thing. I don't know a lot about it, but I have heard that they are already um, growing and bioprinting organs. There are companies that are doing that. And kind of one of the things to, to know about synthetic biology is that when it moves into the company stage, when it's an independent, um, you know, consumer, uh, company, it's getting pretty far along in its life cycle. And it, it, the whole point is to send it out into the world and have it applied. And so there are companies that are starting to do printing of organs, especially um, organs when we're talking about things like skin and um, surface of vasculature, but also bigger organs. As far as when these actually get transplanted into humans, I have no idea. That is totally <laughs> up to the regulatory um, bodies and, you know, all the hugely time consuming um requirements that they have where you first put it in mice and then you put it in pigs and you see how long they live. And the thing is that you can't just put it in them for a week and see if they survive. You got to leave them in there for a while and see what happens over time because a human being is going to hopefully have this, you know, transplanted organ for the rest of their life. What if it's great for 10 years, but then in 15 years it, you know, goes all haywire and we need to, to deal with that. Um, so I do think that Actually, transplanting into humans is probably a little further away, but it's definitely a mature technology it seems as far like, as synthetic biology goes. <laughs> yeah, uh, all these applications that you're kind of putting out there in terms of synthetic biology, you've really sold me on how important this field is. Um, but not only how important it is, like how regulated it is too, so we're not just, you know, in the lab shooting bullets at things trying to make them work. I mean, sometimes we are, but we're doing it in a way with this goal in mind of trying to benefit all of humanity, whether that's through cleaning up the environment or making new materials that could be put into the human body. Um, synthetic biology seems like it's it's something that we need to keep on top of and keep working more towards. So um, if people wanted to find out more about your research, read the paper that um, you've been mentioning and, and all of your work, where can they go to do that? So the paper was published by um, a journal called ACS Synthetic Biology. Um, so uh, if you just 
search for my name on there or um, engineered living materials, it should pop up. It was published in their January 2019 issue. Um, unfortunately, this is a uh, somewhat paywalled journal. So if you are interested um, in a, getting a full PDF of it and you don't have access to the journal, uh, one of the, the things that people don't realize is that the authors of a paper are more than able and allowed to send that PDF out to anybody they want to. So um, if you just tweet me at, at Mary Michael um, or email me at mmsharrier at lbl.gov, I am happy to send you a copy of the paper. Um, if you want to find out more about engineered living materials in general, there are a bunch of really great reviews on that journal as well as um, some other journals that kind of talk about all the different applications um, that you can go for. And one of the things you'll notice is that I find very few synthetic biologists that don't have um, an environmental and um, human benefit mindset. You know, we use synthetic biology because we think it's going to be better for the planet, better for um, human beings. It's going to, you know, replace really, really toxic manufacturing, such as, you know, a lot of the companies starting to make spider silks and leather out of bacteria or milk and, like you said, burgers, actually, out of bacteria. And these are ways to supplant um, industries that are, you know, using cows, which are not great for the environment, or are using um, a bunch of chemicals to create a plastic. You know, we're trying to supplant all that. So these reviews kind of, you'll see a trend in them where they're trying to supplant a negative industry with something that is more sustainable. And that's what I find um, kind of a core of all synthetic biologists that I meet. Um, and then if you want to find out more about um, specifically Colobacter and engineered living materials, you know, just come talk to me um, online. I, I can give you more of a background on that. Um, and there's a bunch of other labs that are doing things that are similar. The Joshi lab uses curly fibers, which are really cool little tendrils that come out of a cell. And they're using that to do um, similar work of attachment and growth of materials. Cool. Right. Well, um, the both of us just want to thank you so much for <laughs> coming on the show and, and, getting us excited about the cool things we can do with science to make our world better. And I'm really glad that, that it seems like the field and the scientists involved in synthetic biology do have that beneficial mindset of, of helping the environment and helping humanity to be better through the knowledge that we gain from that. So thank you so much for your time. Um, Jared, I think we better thank our patrons. Yeah, we should thank our patrons. And of course, we want to thank all of you uh, who help make this show possible. We also, we always start with our escape velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 or more per episode and they get really cool stuff uh, with it. We also have our orbital citizens as well. These folks give us $5 or more per episode. So find your name on there as best you can, if you can find it. And then we have our suborbital citizens who give us $2.50 or more per episode. And you still get perks, even if you're a suborbital citizen. And then even our orbit or our ground support citizens, sorry, I stepped up and then went back down. <laughs> uh, our ground support citizens who give us a dollar or more per episode. You folks even get some nice little things uh, that we like to give you to say thank you. We wouldn't be able to do do these shows without you. We wouldn't be able to uh, have them here. We wouldn't be able to bring in incredible guests to talk about their incredible work that they're doing to benefit all of us with humanity. And if you would like to help make the shows of tomorrow possible, you can head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. So that wraps it up uh, for this science episode, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.